All right, so welcome back to the um, machine learning uh, course that I'm doing with some friends in Austin. <clears throat> this is going to be part two. It's going to be the questions. Hopefully, I can finish it up. So let's go to the book and just do the hunt and peck um, for the questions. Unfortunately, probably not the best way to learn, but <clears throat> this is far from my priority right now. Um, I really um, question the, the value in doing this. I wanted to do it just because I wanted to be involved in the Austin uh, tech culture some way, somehow. Um, I think this is a uh, perhaps an okay way to do that. Um, uh, especially since, I, so I used to be more involved in the Austin tech culture because they had a uh, code mentorship program uh, meetup. There was a uh, a business in Austin. Um, oh, I forget what they're called, but they used to uh, donate their office space every month to uh, this uh, code mentorship uh, program. So anyone from Austin, no fees, no nothing. You just uh, show up to this uh, donated workspace, and uh, some of the employees there would. Um, would uh, stand by, uh, I think, like the C, the CI, CTO, Chief Technology Officer of the, the, the uh, it was a kind of a smaller business, but he would uh, show up sometimes. And uh, we'd just uh, stand up. Sometimes there'd be 30, 40 people in a circle. You'd go around the circle, and then you'd, you'd say why you're there, um, what you want help with, what help you can offer. And then it's just kind of a chaotic environment. I have gone there and, and just because one thing that's kind of nice is um, it's I think it's like four or five hours long. So um, for the last like two hours, it just goes dead. So like I'll, I'll just use the two hours for some peace and quiet in, in this uh, like pretty awesome workspace downtown overlooking the Capitol. Beautiful scenery, beautiful everything. And um, I, I'll just... Um, sit in and work on my own self projects and then i've uh i've taught uh we all huddled in a conference room and i uh, had somebody give a uh a lecture on an intro to python for some people i'm really good at python so i kind of did a lot of um uh, assistant teaching during that um and then i've, I've taught people one-on-one -on -one, uh who, who got stuck on tutorials who didn't know what tutorial to, to work towards uh that sort of thing um, so that was in uh, coronavirus world A, you know, that kind of packed together face-to-face -face, uh, interaction is, is really not uh, uh, appropriate right now in the United States, unfortunately. Um, but I used to go to that fairly regularly. Um, it was the kind of thing, it, it was hard to park down there. So, um, I, you know, if I parked off in the boondocks, um, and, and walked for like 15, 20 minutes, I could pay $15 for parking. Um, my only other option was like $40 for parking. So, um, I skipped here and there, but, um, it was, it was wonderful. And then, um, the, the really cool thing about it is there were a lot of, um, hires and stuff. Um, we got a really good employee, um, working at my old job. Um, that started there just because um, I said I made an announcement. Hey, like anyone who's looking for a job, we've got an open position, and uh, we were actually um, uh, we actually had that open position uh, for a while, really looking to fill it, and found pretty much the perfect candidate um, in that environment. So, anyone watching this right now wants some tips from me for how to get involved in the community, how to get your first job how to get um, what you want out of your career, that's absolutely essential. Just show up to these things, announce yourself. If you're, you're nervous, you have uh, social anxiety, uh, just remember that you've, you, you know, you're behind this uh, veneer of, of, of what you do. It's not a, you're not putting yourself out there. You're, you're there to learn, you're there to teach if you know anything. And um, you're definitely, certainly uh, welcome there. And in fact, uh, if you hadn't showed up, there wouldn't be 
um, as many people there, and it would have been more of a failed event. So I, I'm definitely that kind of person who definitely prefers to stay in, and going to big events like that is, is sometimes kind of an act of, of um, a kind of a <laughs> like moving a mountain to me. It's, it's sometimes hard for me to put myself out there and, and go out and, in two events like that. But um, some kind of mental tools that help me do that is, is one, just uh, knowing what I want, knowing why I'm there, uh, picking the, the thing I attend really carefully so that it's something that I, I know will welcome me. Um, and uh, number two, just uh, kind of uh, realizing that the event has to have people showing up in order to be successful. So if I, if I didn't show up, um, basically no one would be there because other people wouldn't show up and uh, it wouldn't be a, a successful event. So I want to get, I want to have the event be successful. I want to learn. I want to teach. It just makes perfect sense for me to, to go to that. I used to go to it consistently, but then the coronavirus happened, unfortunately. Okay, so that was a tangent. I actually kind of forgot. Oh yeah, right, because I was explaining. I was justifying doing this instead of the billing other things I, I have. Um, so let's um, work on this first uh, question. Why can't we use torch.where to create a loss function for data sets where our label can have more than two categories? So this is going to be chapter six, um, the chapter on multi-categories. So let's do torch dot where. Okay, so let's check what the categories represent in this example. We're using the convenient torch dot where, which tells us all of the indices where our condition is true or false. Oh, now this I would I would say so. Let's check what the categories represent in this example. We are using convenient torch dot where, which tells us all of the indices where our condition is true or false. Now, according to this, I would almost think that you can use torch dot dot where, but. I guess maybe the answer is that um, it just tells you all the indices where it's true or false and, and that's not enough information. The other thing I'm not sure about here is which chapter this aligns with. Um, he really skips all over the, the chapters um, and it's, it's hard to tell um, which chapter is relevant. Ah, here we go. So this looks a little bit better. Um, let's see if it shows up in the questions. Oh, so it still didn't show up in the questions, but there is a lot of information on torch.where there, so that might be a good resource. And it would make sense that there are questions that go back and um, review other chapters. Ah, but unfortunately it looks like torch.where is missing from the questions. Ah, here we go. So it belongs to chapter five, pet breeds. Uh, why can't we use torch style where to create a loss function for data sets where our label can have more than two categories? Let's see if this shows up. So in the binary case, we used torch style where to select between inputs and one dash inputs. When we treat a binary classification as a general classification problem with two categories, it actually becomes even easier because as we saw in the previous section, 
we now have two columns containing the equivalent of inputs and one dash inputs. So all we need to do is select from the appropriate column. Let's try to implement this in PyTorch. So um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why, like this might have to be a, an ask the qu class question. Um, unfortunately, I, I like to keep those as sparse as I can. So why can't we use porch.where where to create a loss function for data sets where a label can have more than two categories? I guess I want to say because it's, um, because it selects between uh, two inputs. But I'll, I'll do a ask the class. Okay, and then I'll say, because it selects between uh, inputs. So it only has inputs. Uh, only has two inputs to select from. Okay, so that's going to be a uh, ask the class, but I think uh, this is the the answer. Okay, so what is the value of log to the negative two and why? So from what I understand, logarithms. So basically. Um, Log log two and and this is I could be really off about this. Um, so if you have x squared, um, uh, equals uh, one. Shoot. Okay, I I, f I forget exactly, but I, if I remind myself with with Khan Academy, um, I I can I can pick it up really fast because I think I think I, I yeah because okay so let's see what a logarithm is. Let's learn a little bit about the wonderful world. Of... Um, let's just go right to the transcript. Um, okay, so here we go. So. So we know how to take exponents. So if I were to say two to the fourth power, um, that would mean two times two times two times two. Uh, okay, so so here's here's I think a good place to start. So for example, let's yeah. say that I start with two and I say I'm raising it to some power. What does that power have to be to get 16? Well, we just figured that out. You would have, x would have to be x, x would have to be four. Four, right. And this is what logarithms are fundamentally about. Figuring out what power you have to raise to to get another number. Now, the way that we would denote this with logarithm notation is we would say log base, actually let me make, the, let me make it a little bit more colorful, log base two, yeah. logs, I'll do this two in blue, log base two of 16 of equals 16, what? Of 16, of 16 is equal to what? Or is equal, yeah. in this case, since we it have the x four. there, is equal to or x. x. Yeah. This and this are completely equivalent statements. This is Okay, so let's go back to the question. So, okay, so log and I assume it's going to be a 1 under there. So, let's let's write that out in in the other um in the other in in, in notepad. 
uh, paint. And one thing I would like to get doing at some point, I do have a old school uh, Galaxy uh, Tab A, uh, a tablet here with the stylus and all that. So if I can find a way to project that through the screen and write, um, I should be able to uh, really uh, kind of enhance these um, these uh, videos. Um, but that's going to be uh, difficult to figure out how to do. Um, my, my tab isn't even charged up. I haven't used it in a long time. Um, okay, it's charging now though. So yep, I'll just leave that, that tab uh, charging and then I will uh, hopefully in a few days uh, be able to add that to my uh, videos instead of just trying to use the mouse and, and trying to use paint like this. I'll be able to actually hand draw on the screen. Okay, so what is the value of log minus two and y? So let's think about what this means. This means, so, uh, oops, uh, okay. So log, so we've got a one down here and then we've got a, a two. Oh, we've got a negative two. Okay, so equals, um, X, so we know that 1 to the X equals negative 2, because these are equivalent statements here. Log is basically just a, a, a thing you can do to uh, move X to the other side of the equation, but logarithms, basically you're just trying to figure out what an unknown exponent is for logarithms. So a way that can help you do that is to be able to manipulate the X in an equation and move it around without changing um, the, uh, the, the equation at all. So um, if two equals two, uh, or sorry, if 16 equals 16, um, log of uh, two, uh, log two, um, yeah, log two of, of uh, four also equals 16, as does um, two to the x, uh, or as of two to the four equals 16. So these are all equivalent statements here. Um, 16 equals 16, no duh, that's obvious. Everyone knows that. But something that might not be clear is that log um, 2 uh, log 2 of Four, I believe that's the correct uh, way to say it. Log two of four equals 16 as well, as does two to the four. That also equals 16. So these are all equivalent statements. So what is the value of log one of negative two? It's going to be one to the uh, one to the, sorry, this, this I actually got wrong. The value of log one to the negative two is going to be, um, one to the negative two. Um, so that's going to be equal to X. We're trying to figure out what X is. Um, huh, it's kind of funny. If this were a square root, I'd actually probably have an easier time with it. Um, but I think it's just going to be... Um, because if this were 2, it would be 1 times 1. But this is a negative 2, so I think it's going to be negative 1 times negative 1. So my answer, I think, is going to be uh, 1. Um, and then Y because of math.
Uh, but I think this is also going to be a ask the class. Um, and then uh, let's look up and see what the book has to say about this. Okay, it has absolutely nothing to say about this. God damn it. Why are they asking the question if they have no, like, information about it? Yeah, I don't know what the log of... I mean, I think it's one, right? I mean, I'll, I'll just do a, a broader uh, Google search. Oh god, it's not one. <laughs> It's whatever this number is. Oh, and there's an I as well. Okay, well let's look at um, yeah, let's let's look at this video. Uh, black pen, red pen. Okay, in this video, let's talk about how we can take care of a natural log of a negative number. I can't of course, hear him. It's not possible in the real world. You have to go to a dark side. I still can't hear him. Let me show you how. Okay, this is a bad video. Um, let's do, um, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I just can't hear him. Like, I'm sure the content is okay. I might have to come back to this because there's nothing, literally nothing else. But, um, let's, uh, well, of course, it's kind of ironic that I would say that about a video like that because I'm actively making videos right now that people can't see in here, so... I, uh, it's not that I'm mad that he's got it um, with bad audio, it's just that I, I literally can't use it, it's unusable. Um, which I, I recognize some of these videos might be, and I apologize for that, I'm, I'm doing the best I can to, uh, to make them uh, usable for myself and for others, but uh, I will admit that at this point, having usable videos is really a, a lower priority for me than just putting in the actual study time. It's really just for self-motivation reasons is why I'm making these. And to have a record, to have a, to have something to show for my work because for the, especially for the JNC IESP, you know, if I take it and, and I fail it, I have nothing to show for it unless I document my study. Okay, so it, it seems a common theme on the internet that taking the log of negative numbers is like not a thing. So I don't know what the log of negative two is. Um, let's go back and watch the um, video we were trying to watch before. This kind of stuff bothers me on, on YouTube. Like, we don't need to see that kind of camera angle. I don't understand. Negative 2 is the same as negative 1 times 2. And when we have a product in that for natural log, we can break this into natural log, the first one, plus natural log, the second one. So we get the first one as being natural log of negative so 1. Microphone? And then we add the second one is natural He's not log of 2. holding it up high enough. So, as you can see, this right here is totally okay, but this right here is totally not okay. Oh, uh, okay, so that's why I'm not seeing log of negative numbers, because you can't take a log of a negative number. So it looks like a trick you can do is you can use the, uh, I forget what it's called, the associative property, the distributed property, but you can use the rule in mathematics that says if you're multiplying, uh, well, it says that you can you can divide these out into we two have separate to fix terms. This right here, and to do so, we are going to go to the complex plane for it. So let me just write down R E right here for the real axis, and this right here I'll put down I M for the imaginary axis. Do not put on capital R. Do not put on capital C. Unlike somebody back in 2017, don't do that. Anyway, negative one on the complex plane is going to be right here because. It's just the same as saying negative one plus zero i, so it's on the real axis. And yeah, now, man. don't forget that. See, this is another thing I was worried about with this exam. It's like I legitimately want to learn math, but like it's not appropriate to learn math just by diving into the hardest course. 
Like, math all is, like, cumulative. So, like, you're not going to have fun learning math unless you learn at the level that you're ready to learn. Like, I think learning math is, like, really fun and enriching and rewarding. But if it's over your head, it's over your head. you got to back up and learn the stuff that you're ready to learn. That's just my view on it. Maybe people don't agree, but this is over my head. So I think I'm going to do a ask, ask the class. I'm going to say uh, one because of math and then say the actual Yeah, let's see if there's any videos No. Okay, yeah, I don't see any answer in the book. So here's the actual answer. Um, I don't know what what that means. It looks like there are uh, imaginary numbers associated in this. I, I prefer to call them uh, lateral numbers. Or, sorry. Uh, yeah, lateral numbers. Because that's what Gauss calls them. Uh, lateral numbers. Yeah, yeah, lateral numbers. Because uh, an imaginary number, from what I understand, is basically just if you have a number line. Uh, let me see. Oh, God damn it. Yeah, so if, if I have a number line, um, and then I have uh, 1, 2, and 3 on my number line, like an imaginary number doesn't fit anywhere on this number line. Like, where would you put it? So so what people do to represent management, uh, imaginary numbers is to create another number line like this, and it's, it's basically just another, it's, it's lateral to... Like, it's not imaginary, it's an actual number, it's just lateral to the, um, the original number line. It doesn't fit anywhere on that original number line, so you have to have another number line in order to represent that number. Um, now, I don't know why they can make it perpendicular to, maybe that's just kind of a stylistic thing, but um, yeah, I just don't know enough about, about that. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Already, um, already pretty, um, pretty far beyond me. Um, so what are two good rules of thumb for picking a learning rate from the learning rate finder? So, uh, so one is uh, lowest rate divided by 10, I think, I remember from the video. Okay, so one of the most important things we can do when training a model is make sure that we have the right learning rate. If our learning rate is too low, it can take many many epochs to train our model not only does this waste time but it also means that we may have problems with overfitting because every time we do a complete pass through the data we give our model a chance to memorize it so let's just make sure our learning rate is really high right nope because of overfitting sure let's try that and see what happens that doesn't look good. Here's what happened. The optimizer stepped in the correct direction, but it stepped so far that it totally overshot the minimum loss. Repeating that multiple times makes it get further and further away, not closer and closer. What do we do to find the perfect learning rate? Not too high, not too low. In 2015, the researcher Leslie Smith came up with a brilliant idea called the learning rate finder. His idea was to start with a very, very small Learning rate is something so small that we would never expect it to be too big to handle. We use that for one mini batch to find what the losses are afterwards. 
and then increase the loading rate by some percentage, e.g. doubling it each time. Then we do another mini batch, track the loss and double the learning rate again. We keep doing this until the learning rate gets worse instead of better. This is the point where we know we have gone too far. We then select a learning rate a bit lower than this point. Our advice is to pick either one order of magnitude less than where the minimum loss was achieved, minimum divided by 10. So that's what I remembered. Um, yeah, but let's use the language in the book. All right, the last point where the loss was already was clearly decreasing. All right. So let's move on to the next one. What do what two steps does the fine tune method do? Oh man, I'm starting to get really hungry, but I've got food coming. Okay, so when we call the fine tune method, FastAI does two things. Trains the randomly added layers for one epoch with all other layers frozen. And then unfreezes all of the layers and trains them all for the number of epochs requested. All right, in Jupyter Notebook, how do you get the source code for a method or function? I think I remember uh, this. Um, it's just going to be question, question mark at the end. Um, but let's, first of all, let's do, Yeah, so question mark, question mark at the end. Yep, I was right. What are discriminative learning rates? Okay, we got a definition right here. This has improved our model a bit, but there's more we can do. The deepest layers of our pre-trained model might not need as high a learning rate as the last ones, so we should probably use different learning rates for those. So this is known as discriminating learning rates, which are learning rates for the deepest later layers of the pre-trained model. Um, yeah. Rates. Um, typically lower for the deepest layers of our pre-trained model. Okay, so how is a Python <clears throat> slice object um, interpreted when passed as a learning rate too fast AI. Let's uh, look at that. I think I remember this. Um, ah, lets you path a pass a Python slice object anywhere that a learning rate is expected. The first value passed will be the learning rate in the earliest layer of the neural network, and the second value will be the learning rate in the final layer. The layers in between will have learning rates that are multiplicatively equidistant throughout that range. Let's use this approach to replicate the previous training, but this time we'll only set the lowest layer of our net to a learning rate of 1e minus 6. The other layers will scale up to 1e minus 4. Let's train for a while and see what happens. Okay. 
Okay, so the first value passed will be the learning rate. Second, yeah, so this is, oh, so this is the answer. So the question is, how was a slice object interpreted when passed uh, as a learning rate to fast AI? So the first value passed will be the learning rate in the earliest layer of the neural network. The second value will be the learning rate in the final layer. The layers in between will have learning rates that are multiplicatively equidistant throughout the range. All right, why is early stopping a poor choice when using one cycle training? Before the days of one cycle training, it was very common to save the model at the end of each epoch and then select whichever model had the best accuracy out of all models saved in each epoch. This is known as early stopping. However, this is very unlikely to give you the best answer because those epochs in the middle occur before the learning rate has had a chance to reach the small values where it can really find the best result. Therefore, if you find that you have overfit, you should actually do what you should actually do is retrain your model from scratch and this time select a total number of epochs based on where your previous best results were found. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, let's move on. Uh, before I move on, I, I very obviously need a glass of water, so I'll go get that. Okay, I'm back, let's keep going. Um, what is the difference between ResNet 50 and ResNet 101? Oh, okay. So it looks like they're referring to it with different syntax in the way they talk about it. Ah, here we go. The ResNet architecture that we are using in this chapter comes in variants with 1834, 50101, and 152 layer, pre-trained on ImageNet. A larger, more layers and parameters, sometimes described as the capacity of a model version of a ResNet, will always be able to give us a better training loss, but it can suffer more from overfitting because it has more parameters to overfit with. In general, a bigger model has the ability to better capture the real underlying relationships in your data and also to capture and memorize the specific details of your individual images. However, using a deeper model is going to require more GPU RAM. So you may need to lower the size of your batches to avoid an out of memory error. Okay, so the higher this number, the more chances you have of a higher memory error era and the more chances you have of overfitting, but the more chances you have of, of capturing the actual real underlying uh, uh, thing you want to capture in your data. If it's not uh, a high enough number here, um, you might be capturing based on things such as what color is, is the background, that sort of stuff, because you won't be able to see the image in enough detail to actually do what you want. Oh man, I'm very hungry right now, but I've got food at... Uh, food coming soon. Gotta go drive to pick it up, but I'm supposed to be driving my car because I let it sit for too long and it had issues. So I will be driving it. 
What does that do? Okay, so Okay, so the other downside of deeper architectures is that they take a bit longer to train. One technique that can speed things up a lot is mixed precision training. Um, this refers to using a using less precise numbers, half precision floating point, also called FP16. Um, as where possible during training. As we are writing these words in early 2020, nearly all current NVIDIA GPUs support a special feature called Tensor Cores that can dramatically speed up neural network training by two through three. They also require a lot less GPU memory to enable this feature in fast AI, just to add after your learning creation. Okay. So that looks good. Oops. There we go. So next question, how could multi-label classification improve the usability of the bear classifier? Okay, so it looks like this is spread out uh, to another chapter. Uh, let's check chapter six. Okay, so multi-level classification. Multi-level classification refers to the problem of identifying the categories of objects in images that may not contain exactly one type of object. There may be more than one kind of object or when no objects um, you're looking for. Okay, yeah, so so here we could say if, if there, yeah, so you could identify when there isn't a bear in the Okay, so how do we encode the dependent variable in a multi-classification problem, multi-label classification problem? Okay, this might have to be a, an ask the class. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, ah, so this I think is it. Okay, I, I don't I don't see the answer. Oh.
Um, I guess I want to say that you used the data set class. I guess I guess one hot encoding. Yeah, I think this is it, but this is definitely going to be an ask the class. Okay, so how do you access the rows and columns of a data frame if it was as if it was a matrix? Okay, <clears throat> the iLock property. All right, next question. How do you get a column by name from a data frame? Okay, um, so you can get it by indexing into a data frame directly. Okay, what is the difference between a data set and a data loader? So data set is a um, collection that returns a tuple of your independent and dependent variables for a single item. Okay, and then a data loader, an iterator that provides a stream of mini batches where each mini batch is a tuple of a batch of independent variables and a batch of dependent variables. What does a data sets object normally contain? Um, I mean, I would think it would be a, a tuple of your independent dependent variable for a single item, but um, we'll look into that. But I'll just leave that there for now. Oh, I see. Oh, okay, so there's an S at the end of this object. So this is a data set, um, but this is a data sets object. So what does that normally contain? Uh, it contains a training data set and validation data set. So a data sets object has uh, two uh, data set classes. It's basically like a list or, or a, an array of uh, classes. All right, what does a data loader's object normally contain? All right, what does Lambda do in Python besides make everything awful for everyone? Is Lambda even in Python 3? I've got Python 2 on my computer. Um, but let's see what uh, Lambda does. So this is just a shortcut for defining and then referring to a function. Yeah, and Lambda is like the worst thing ever. I hate it. But let's uh, play around with it. So I'm going to do a CMD. And then uh, I'm going to do a Python 
uh, or let's do a pi dash three uh, dash m i python. All right, and then let's play around with uh, lambdas. So we're going to do lambda uh, x. Um, so and then we're going to do. Uh, Yeah, I, I don't I never use lambdas. They're awful. They're not Pythonic. I hate them. I never use them. It almost seems like it, it's kind of funny because it's like part of the purpose of Python is to make everything Pythonic. So like you know it doesn't. It's almost kind of can be criticized by like, oh, I'm trying to dumb down coding and make it so any idiot can do it. It's like, well, yeah, that's the point. Cause like, you know, imagine coming back to this in a hundred years, we need to know what all this stuff means. Like the Rosetta Stone, you know, was used for translation. Like we're gonna have to use things like the Rosetta Stone for translation. We're not gonna know what any of this stuff means in a thousand years from now. So yeah, it needs to be, really simple and clear and it almost seems like what a lot of people's first instincts is when using python is just make it less clear it's like come on so lambda was uh, always part of the original python i think and to me it's just uh, i'd rather somebody just define a function Oh, okay, I see. So let's do uh, <clears throat> temp equals lambda r. And then, okay, it looks like r okay, so we'll do x plus 1. Okay, let's, let's do a, a quick uh, lambda tutorial. Okay, here we go. W3 schools is classic. Ah, here we go. So x equals lambda a a plus 10. So let's do a help on x. So else x is like a special lambda thing. Uh, so uh, let's do a print x five okay so now we got 15 so let's let's do this again slower um and then let's see how we can write it without using lambda okay so this is what we would do for uh, lambda, so we can see here we've got uh, the five, which is a, um, and then five plus ten is is fifteen. Okay, so let's try to um, uh, do this uh, without it being a lambda function. Yeah, and you can see how, how angry <laughs> Lambda makes me feel because, like, look, it's just so much easier. You know you're defining a function, you know you're you're taking in a parameter to that function, and you know you're returning something. This is, this is, in my mind, a much, much better way. Yes, it's two lines of code instead of one line, ooh, but, you know, it runs as fast, it's, it's the, the return output from it is, is able to be serialized. It's, there's just no reason to ever use. In fact, let's do this. Why does any Python programmer ever use Lambda ever?
Okay, well, there's... Yeah, they should have just used the word function for this. Like, seriously, like, f equals function x. Yeah, they just used the wrong word for it. Like, what does lambda even mean? Okay, so it's it's a letter of an alphabet. Um, so it's the letter of the Greek alphabet. Is it a mathematical symbol? Okay. Yeah, I, I think they they just used the wrong word. Yeah, lambda function should be used sparingly and with a extraordinary care. I mean, just look at this, and you can even do def x a return a plus ten. You can you can put that all on one line. You don't have to have a new line after and then you can do x5 like this this is you know a few characters longer but does that matter how many characters does it need to be like as long as it's under 80 so it's not pouring off the side of the screen it's fine and even then just make a new line why is that a problem Yeah, so stop writing them, but uh, they say that there are really specific cases where they are uh, useful. But I'm not going to read about those cases because my own um, experience with Python has been uh, that, so that those special caveat edge cases uh, really aren't <laughs> necessary. Um, I've, I've gotten a lot of really good uh, use out of Python without having to break the rules and use a special edge case. Okay, what are the methods to customize how the independent and dependent variables are created with the data block API? So I think it's going to be the summary method. Um, let's look at uh, number five. Oh man, it's time for lunch. Uh, I just want to hold out for a while. I don't know if I can though, but it's only going to be another hour. Oh my God. All right, chapter five. Although the question was asked here.
This might be another ask the class, actually. But I might be able to figure it out. I can also go to the forum. That's off. That's better than asking the class, actually, in a lot of cases. Yeah, so here's the deep learning forum. Okay, now I can search in here. Okay, so I found it. All the answers to the questions are uh, right there. So I'm just going to copy them over, get X and get Y, and then uh, maybe um, go back to the book and read, read about it. I did get a notification on my phone um, that I uh, want to check because it might be related to my lunch order. I didn't see any good additional information for get X and get Y. Um, that's something I think I want to bring up to the class because I really don't understand it. Oh. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so why is softmax not an appropriate output activation function when using a one-hot encoded target? Let's go to the question here. Softmax wants to make the model predict only a single class, which may not be true in a multi-label classification problem. In multi-label classification problems, the input data could have multiple labels or even no labels. Okay, why is NLL underscore LOSS not an appropriate loss function when using a one hot encoded data function data target? Again, NLL underscore loss only works for when the model only needs to predict one class, which is not the case here. What is the difference between those two types of loss? Um, NN.BCE loss does not include the initial sigmoid. It assumes that the appropriate activation function, i.e. the sigmoid, has already been applied to the predictions NN.BCE with log its loss, on the other hand, does both the sigmoid and cross entropy in a single function? Why can't we use regular accuracy in a multi label problem? The regular accuracy function assumes that the final model predicted class is the one with the highest activation. However, in multi-label problems, there can be multiple labels, 
Therefore, a threshold for the activations needs to be set for choosing the final predicted classes based on the activations for comparing to the target classes. When is it okay to tune a hyperparameter on a validation set? It is okay to do so when the relationship between the hyperparameter and the metric being observed is smooth. With such a smooth relationship, we would not be picking an appropriate outlier, an inappropriate outlier. Okay, I don't think I can implement this myself and test it without peaking. It's just, it's getting far too beyond me. Um, and at this point, um, literally, there are only the last uh, course, which was an easy course that only involved uh, reading. Um, there were uh, only three people from the group <laughs> who showed up for the, the entire length of the discussion. And um, there were originally like 10, so... Uh, I don't think I'm going to spend that kind of time on it. Oh, uh, there's 45 questions. I don't think I'm even halfway done. Okay, what is a regression problem? What loss function should you use for such a problem? In a regression problem, the dependent variable or labels we are trying to predict are continuous values. For such problems, the mean squared error loss function is used. What do you need to do to make sure the fast API library applies the same data augmentation to your inputs images and your target point coordinates? You need to use the correct data block. In this case, it is the point block. The data block automatically handles the application data augmentation to the input images and the target point coordinates. OK, so I'm guessing these are from chapter 7. Oh, it looks like they're actually from chapter 8. Okay, so what problem does collaborative filtering solve? It solves the problem of predicting the interests of users based on the interests of other users and recommending items based on the, these interests. All right, how does it solve it? The key idea of collaborative filtering is latent factors. The idea is that the model can tell what kind of items you may like. For example, you like sci-fi movies and books. These kinds of factors are learned via basic gradient descent based on what items other users like, um, which frustrates me to no end because I don't want something recommending something to me. I want to make my own decisions and decide what I want. Not based on what a group of people are doing necessarily. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It depends on what I am looking for. Like a group of people I have never met and I don't know what they believe or, or why they're buying the things they are buying, I think is an inappropriate data set to use to recommend me things I might like. I don't know these people. I don't know why they're buying the books they're buying. Don't show me recommendations based on the things they have purchased, please. Why might a collaborative filtering predictive model fail? to be a very useful recommendation system. 
there are not many recommendations if there are not many recommendations to learn from or enough data about the user to provide useful recommendations then such collaborative filtering systems may not be useful What does a cross-tab representation of collaborative filtering data look like? In the cross-tab representation, the users and items are the rows and columns or vice versa of a large matrix with the values filled out based on the user's rating of the item. Write the code to create a cross-tab representation of the movie lens data. You might need to do some web searching to do by the reader. Um, so I'm going to ask the class. I don't know if I can do this. I might do a part three and try to work my way through this, but uh, yesterday I did a JNCIE video and... Uh, my JNCIE test is literally in like a month, so I'd like to do that if I'm going to do a second video today. So this might have to be it, just answering all the questions, but I might, I might go back and, and do this. As so what is a latent factor? Why is it latent? As described above, a latent factor are factors that are important for the prediction of the recommendations but are not explicitly given to the model and instead learned, hence latent. What is a dot product? Calculate a dot product manually using pure Python with lists. So a dot product is when you multiply the corresponding elements of two vectors and add them up. If we represent the vectors as lists of the same size, here is how we can perform a dot product. Okay, what does pandas.dataframe.merge do. It allows you to merge data frames into one data frame. All right, what is an embedding matrix? It is what you multiply an embedding with, and in the case of this collaborative filtering problem, is learned through training. What is the relationship between an embedding and a matrix of one-hot encoded vectors? An embedding is a matrix of one-hot encoding vectors that is computationally more efficient. Why do we need embedding if we could use one-hot encoded vectors for the same thing? Embedding is computationally more efficient. The multiplication with one hot encoded vectors is equivalent to indexing into the embedding matrix and the embedding layer does this. However, the gradient is calculated such that it is equivalent to the multiplication with the one hot encoded vectors. What does an embedding contain before we start training, assuming we're not using a pre-trained model? The embedding is randomly initialized. Create a class without peeking if possible and use it. So this I can do, I'm just gonna do this right here. So we're gonna do class um, example. And we're going to do def init um, self, and it's going to be self dot um, array um, 
equals array. Okay, and then it's going to be def say array. Self print self dot array. Okay, so here there's the class and we can do dot say array. Oh, did I did I spell it wrong or something? Oh yeah, I spell it with two O's. Oh, and I I accidentally I spelled it right here, but I spelled it wrong up there, so that's what's going wrong. But I can I can do it. So let's see what the forum had. Yeah, so this is basically what I did. Alright, let me try that again just because that was embarrassing to not be able to do that. Okay, so it's going to be um, class example def init self uh, self dot uh, array uh, equals array def say array self return Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. So test equals example. Let's see. Okay, well, for some reason I can't do this. Yeah, I'm not used to doing it in like, yeah. Oh, I see. Because it's it's the local namespace, so it doesn't have uh, self dot array. It belongs to the local namespace to this function. So I would have to pass it to this function. I think.
I don't understand why I can't do this. Um, I, I thought I understood classes. Um, uh, yeah, I thought I understood classes. Let's just do a quick uh, tutorial on them. Yeah, W3 schools looks good. So, yep, here, we, let's try to do one that was more complicated. Oh, yeah, okay, this is what I thought. God damn it, that's what I was doing wrong. I, th I thought that was what I was doing wrong. Ah, okay, well, let, let me just do the, the example they have here. Just because I want to uh, get out of the habit. Oh, I even did, I didn't do the whack, the uh, whatever, a num or whatever it's called. Dunder, dunder is what it's called. I didn't do the dunder. Okay, so now we can do P1 equals person John 36 print P1 dot name print P1 dot age. Okay, so that's okay. I, yeah, I, you can tell I'm I'm fading fast. <laughs> oh. All right, so, okay, so this returns the user IDs. All right, rewrite the dot product class without peaking if possible and train a model with it. Um, okay, so let's do uh, an ask the class on this one. Okay, and then here's the code that they used. All right, so what is a good loss function to use for a movie lens and why? We can use mean squared error, MSE, which is a perfectly reasonable loss as we have numerical targets for the rating and it is one possible way of representing the accuracy of the model. Okay, what would happen if we used cross entropy loss with movie lens? How would we need to change the model? We would need to ensure the model outputs five predictions. For example, with a neural network model, we need to change the last linear layer to output five, not one predictions. Then this is passed into the cross entropy loss. What is the use basis in a dot product model? A basis, oh sorry, bias, will compensate for the fact that some movies are just amazing or pretty bad. It will also compensate for users who often have more positive or negative recommendations in general. All right, so I put in about an hour and a half, um, so I think that's going to be it for me. Um, I really wanted to <clears throat> keep this to five hours or less per week. Um, I think that's pretty much all I've got to give. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be it. Um, a lot of really technical stuff uh, kind of went right over my head, unfortunately. Um, there is one question I didn't uh, get to, even with the... Uh, forum and that was um, the self exercise um, so I might come back to that I might I might not um, and to be honest um, I would not be surprised if I showed up to class on, on tomorrow and I was the only person there or just me and one other person was there 
Um, I mean, I'd be willing to finish the uh, next wall. To be honest, I actually might even need to drop out because I've got to do um, the JNC IESP. So, yeah, I don't think this warrants a, a lot of uh, uh, extra work. So I'm going to end the video here. I might do a part three to um, write the code to create a cross-tab representation of the movie lens data um, or, or, or whatever the, uh, yeah, or, or whatever the, the self-exercise was meant to be. Um, but for now, um, I'll end it. So thanks for watching and see you in, in the next one.